The good news is our session is about to start. Uh, you've made a really good choice by coming to this session. Uh, we've got a fantastic panel here on a really interesting and timely topic. And uh, I think we've got a really important and uh, interesting discussion ahead. So my name is Kate. Uh, my day job, I'm a political scientist. I teach at the University of Western Ontario. But for the purposes of this panel, the most important thing about my bio is that I'm a Londoner. And I'm a really proud citizen. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, really proud to live in a city that took the leap and had its first ranked ballot election and, and uh, historic first in Canada in 2018. And so today we're going to share with you the story of that election. Uh, you're going to hear a little bit about how this came about in London, what the first experience was like uh, using ranked ballots for a municipal race. And then we're going to end with a really specific call to action, which is if you would like to see ranked ballots in your municipality, you have the opportunity to push for that, and we're going to talk a little bit about how you can do that. So to tell the story of London's ranked ballot election, we have three phenomenal speakers here, and you're essentially going to hear kind of the same story, but from three very different perspectives. So first off, we're going to hear from Dave Meslin. I am sure he needs no introduction in this crowd. He is a very well-known activist, organizer, author. He's got a new book coming out called Teardown. Yes, I almost said Takedown, which is the title of Patrick Brown's new book. Very different book. I, well, I haven't read your book yet, but I assume it's very different. Uh, so Dave is probably Canada, if not uh, globally, one of the leading advocates for uh, ranked choice voting or ranked ballots. So he's going to paint a broad context for us about ranked ballots. You know, what they are, how it works, why it's important, and how we got to this point of having the first ranked ballot election uh, in London this fall. We will then turn and hear from Jesse Helmer. Jesse is the deputy mayor of the city of London. And full disclosure, one of the reasons I think Jesse is so great, he's also my partner. So just uh, naming that bias right there. But uh, Jesse's contribution to the panel is really important because if we roll the clock back a number of years, he was actually the citizen uh, before he was an elected official who registered the domain name for the group that was pushing locally for ranked ballots. He was involved in this movement as a citizen. He was then elected in 2014 to city council, and uh, he's got a really interesting story about that election, but he became one of the councillors who pushed for it and ultimately made the decision to go in that direction. He now serves as the city's deputy mayor, and uh, he's got a really interesting story to tell. And then last, but certainly not least, we are going to hear from Ariel Kegabaya. Ariel is amazing, and in a few minutes you're going to hear from her and know exactly what I mean. She uh, was recently elected to London City Council. She's the city's new Ward 13, or downtown councillor, and she is the first black woman to be elected to London City Council. Uh, she, has, she led just a phenomenal campaign with really interesting dynamics. There were eight candidates running. She was the only woman. She was the youngest by a long shot, and uh, has publicly cited that uh, were it not for ranked ballots, she may not have run in the first place. So she's got a really interesting story to tell as well. So with all of that said, Dave, I will turn it over to you to uh, share with us a little bit about ranked ballots and paint that broad context so we can get started. Sure. Thanks. All right. So excited to be here with both of you and you and all of you. Um, let me start by saying that we should all be greatly embarrassed that we're even having this discussion, that it is something seen as worthy of debate. Um, I'm not a like hardcore or, or ideologically driven person. In fact, I'm cursed um, with the ability to see the other side of almost every story. And it's hard as an advocate um, to always um, hear your opponent's argument and have it partially resonate with you because it, it gives you self-doubt. But it's, it's, in, in the end, it's probably a good thing. Um, but if there's one issue where that curse doesn't really come to play, it's ranked ballots because there is no counter argument. This isn't an actually something that can be debated. Um, it, it frustrates me to no end that I was here last year talking about it and I'm here again. I don't wanna be here next year being like, hey, should we do ranked ballots? Think of the Scarborough transit debate, right? That's an interesting debate. And some of you feel frustrated. You're like, it's gotta be LRT, it's gotta be subway, but there is shreds of validity on both sides. I'm fascinated by that discussion. The equivalent of this would be filling an auditorium and saying, the debate today is if we have Scarborough, uh, if we have new rapid transit to Scarborough, should the vehicles have wheels? And you got people like us being like, yeah, <laughs> is that a question? And then you got people like Justin Diciano coming in being like, well, there's actually good reasons why you wouldn't wanna have wheels on rapid transit. It's a lot more maintenance. 
uh, if we didn't have wheels, it would cut the cost of buying the wheels. There's no, there's no evidence that transit systems without wheels don't work, you know, whatever. And you'd be like, am I wasted? Why am I in this room? This is such a stupid debate. So I'm really eager to get ranked ballots happening in all of our cities so we can actually have more interesting debates about, about um, much more interesting uh, and complex reforms that are desperately needed. This is a no-brainer. Um, and the, 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 the proof of that is that all the people who are opposed, supposedly against it use it. All of our city councils, for example, use some form of runoff voting to uh, choose their own chairs of committees, for example. Most councils in Ontario, if a city councilor resigns or, or dies uh, tragically midterm, and they have to appoint someone as an interim replacement, they use runoff voting with the 50% threshold and round by round eliminations to choose one to choose a replacement. Otherwise, you could end up with a replacement that most of them didn't want. Um, Rob Chiano, who is one of the um, founders of Keep Voting Simple, um, it was him, uh, Nick Kuvalis, and Justin DiCiano. Each of them in their own way has used ranked ballots in their own work and has, has never complained about it. In fact, Rob Chiano not only was a member of the Conservative Party when they used ranked ballots to elect a leader, he was the friggin' president of the Ontario Provincial Conservatives. They used a ranked ballot to choose their leader, and then he launches this group called Keep Voting Simple, because people don't understand ranked ballots. It's only elite insiders who are fighting us, and we need to just get this done. Um, and of course, every party in Canada, every party in Canada uses ranked ballots to choose their leaders. So this, this, this just has to happen, it has to happen now. And the, the title of this was, It's Time for Ranked Ballots. It was time 10 years ago, and 20 years ago, and 50 years ago. We need to just do this. Um, and thank God that London has shown that you can do it and the sky doesn't fall. In fact, great things can happen. So let me just quickly um, give you the context of how we got to where we are. We won provincial legislation three years ago that allows cities in Ontario to use ranked ballots. That was a big victory, which is, again, Stupid. Canada is the only OECD country that uses first past the post, which isn't even a voting system really. It's a, it's an, a very expensive exercise of random, r randomizing outcome of a, of a, I don't even want to use the word election, of a political charade. Um, we're the only country that uses this non-voting system first past the post at all three levels, except now London has broken that that um, paradigm. Um, so the province introduced legislation for the first time allowing cities to use a ranked ballot. And there's 444 municipalities in Ontario. Two of them said, let's hold a referendum. That was Kingston and Cambridge, and I helped run both yes campaigns, and we won them both three months ago. So that's, that's happening. And we won them big, over 60% in Kingston. And then London, which is so funny, because London wasn't even on my radar. And that, this is kind of a funny story, which you alluded to. So I was keeping track of like, which groups, where do I have people on the ground? Toronto's good, I got this rabbit thing. Um, there's a one, two, three uh, Ottawa group. I've got some great energy in Whitby. There was a uh, Mita Williams in Windsor and a small Hamilton group. And there was this group in London a few years ago. There was a Josh guy and a Jesse guy. And, I've stopped hearing from them. I can't even reach them anymore. So I kind of just wrote off London. I'm like, whatever, jerks. <laughs> it turns out they stopped, um, they stopped getting back to me about ranked ballots and the 123 London campaign because they got elected onto council and they were really busy implementing ranked ballots. I didn't even know. So suddenly out of the blue, London, Ontario is just like, we're doing ranked ballots. I'm like, I recognize those names. Um, and then I went to London to witness this historic um, evening of the first non-first-past-the-post election in, in my lifetime, in my country. And um, I spent the morning in Kingston just doing some final referendum campaign prep. And then I got on a via train, and by four in the afternoon, I was in London. I was doing radio interviews and print interviews. But I'm like, I should just pick some candidate and, like, hang out with them and see, like... Just, you know, I'm here, this will be fun. So I asked a few people around and they were like, Ariel's really cool. You know, maybe, maybe check out her campaign. I was like, can she win? 
like, because that'd be really cool to be like, to see like an underdog win. They were like, I don't know, it's our first time. And I just had this cool hunch. So we were just hanging out. And it was really funny because on the first round, you'll, you'll, you'll hear this in a minute, she didn't win, but was in the lead. And I was like, oh no, this is, this is terrible. She would have won without a ranked ballot. <laughs> I've, I've, ru I've ruined her career. And then, um, but of course, ranked ballots don't just change the math. They, they change who runs and how they run and why they run and, and lots of things. Um, but then we were hanging out the next day and I, I had such the um, luck and the blessing to be in the kitchen with you when the results came in. And um, what a moment for you, I'm sure. But for me, it was just really, it was great to share that with you. And it was great. A lot of the work we do as advocates is behind the scenes. And um, I don't think ranked ballots should take the credit for your victory. There's, you, you won. <laughs> and you might have you run with it without it. I don't even care. We should never try and find, you know, one story and say, this is proof that it works. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I was, um, it was great. Yeah. And um, I'm so jealous of London and so ashamed of my city. And with that, I'll pass the mic to people who can actually speak of experience of living in a city that has fair elections, because I've never lived in one. I think, we, yeah, Dave, you've worked a very long time for this, so thank you very much. Uh, Jesse, let's hear from you. Uh, thank you. I, I'm going to try and um, focus in on the 2014 uh, election, because uh, that's part of the reason why I support uh, ranked ballots, and, uh, and talk a little bit about how we actually implemented them in London. Um, I'm certainly happy to answer in the questions. hope we can have lots of questions. Uh, any of the questions about the impact in 2018? Uh, but I'm not going to talk too much about that. So uh, as Kate mentioned, back in 2014, so we're talking like March 2014, we had a small group of people who were putting together an initiative to try and convince candidates who are running in that election uh, to support, at that time, asking the province to allow municipalities to implement ranked ballots. The provincial election hadn't happened yet, uh, so this was coming up in June. We were getting organized in March and, and we had a petition. So we had a website, we had a petition, and the petition says, do you support asking the province to allow municipalities to have ranked ballots? So uh, there were 87 candidates in that election running for council or mayor. And uh, we, throughout the course of the campaign, we managed to convince 20 of them to sign the petition. So that's not bad. We had 23% of the candidates had said, yeah, we support um, uh, bringing the option to municipalities. The really good outcome in that uh, campaign was that eight of those 20 people were elected to council. So the council's 15 people, uh, eight is the magic number to get something done. And so we were pretty happy. First of all, I was pretty happy. I'd been elected as one of those councillors. Um, but there was a lot of other people who had already said, you know, we like, we like ranked ballots. And so things were looking pretty good. In the meantime, of course, the province, the provincial elections happened, the liberals were elected and the mandate letters were issued to the ministers and in the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Ted McMeek, and his mandate letter said, look at this option of allowing ranked ballots and, and go make that happen. So a lot of things were going in the right direction thanks to the advocacy of, uh, of folks throughout the province, um, including Dave. And I wanna talk about why ranked ballots are helpful. And I, I think I agree with Dave that, you know, this is, a, this is an improvement over what we were doing before. It is not the solution to every problem uh, in politics or the electoral system. Uh, it is one, I think, small improvement that makes things better. Um, we had an election where we had seven candidates running. We had an incumbent who was not very popular. Um, and two of the candidates who were running as challengers uh, were sort of in the lead and uh, in agreement on a lot of policy. One of them was a woman named Cheryl Ruth. Uh, she had filed very early in the campaign. Uh, she was out there trying to raise money and get volunteers and knocking on doors. And one of them was me. And I had filed after her. Uh, I was out there raising money, trying to get volunteers, knocking on doors. And so we went through the period of, say, April when I filed to August. And in a, an election dynamic like that, where you have one incumbent and a bunch of challengers, you know, the first part of the election is who is the main challenger, right? Because unfortunately, in first past the post, that's what it kind of comes down to, is convincing, first of all, the media that it's worth bothering to look at it. Uh, maybe the incumbent would lose. Um, and then... Within that, you know, which of these challengers is the one who's most likely to win? 
And so there's a lot of that, you know, who has the most signs, who, who's raising money, who's got a lot of volunteers. And uh, the, the early part of the campaign is very focused on that. And so at a certain point in August, uh, Cheryl decided that if she both, if both of us went all the way to the end, the incumbent was going to get reelected. You know, there were people who liked her, there were people who liked me, we agreed on a lot of things, we were kind of dividing up the vote. Lots of people wanted to get rid of the incumbent, but if we went to the end, he would win. He'd get reelected, and that's not what the community wanted, that's not what she wanted. And so she decided uh, to drop out and to support me instead. So you just imagine that, there's 440 municipalities, 444 municipalities in Ontario. Imagine that being repeated, say there's 10 council spots in each of those municipalities, right? That's 4,000 something um, council spots. All those candidates, that gets repeated over and over and over again. And in those situations, the person who is, uh, let's say, overconfident, cocky, very aggressive, right, me, <laughs> Uh, stays in, and the person who's like more community-minded, wants to do the right thing, isn't really selfish or ego-driven, those are people who drop out. And, you know, without totally generalizing, that often means men stay in and women step aside. So even if they have done the work and made the decision to run in the first place, the first past the post puts them in that situation over and over and over again to say, do you really want to take this to the end or would you rather drop out and support somebody else? And so it was very clear to me. I mean, I supported ranked ballots uh, in theory uh, before that, but having gone through that process, right, having been the person who basically forced a very qualified, very talented woman to drop out, right? That, you know, I knew that was a bad outcome, right? And so we needed to fix that system, right? Because the system's going to keep creating that situation over and over again. So. Uh, when it came time to actually implement ranked ballots, we first we got into the strategic plan. In the municipal government, uh, there's a whole process of getting things done, and it takes a long time. And the early part is get it, get agreement about it as a general idea, and, and we got we got that. Um, and then we had to wait. We had to wait for the province. So the province had to pass the legislation, right? And that took a long time. So we waited around till I think 2016 before the legislation was passed. Um, then we had to raise the screen, and uh, uh, yeah, um, and so we had to wait. And and in the meantime, you know, the staff of the city were working on, you know, how's this going to work? And for it actually to be implemented, we need not just the legislation, but also the regulations, right? How exactly is that going to work? And it's not up to the municipality. So uh, there was this period where we sort of had it in the strategic plan. People seemed very supportive. We had this majority of people on council who supported it. But not much was happening. So it kind of went a little bit uh, dormant. And the province was doing their thing, and then it came back. And when it came back, it came back in early 2017. So January 2017, we got a report from the city clerk. The city clerk runs the election. And the city clerk said, here's our report back on your idea about implementing ranked ballots, and our recommendation is you should not do it. <laughs> and um, that was not helpful. You know, that was very... Uh, it was very difficult. Basically, the clerk said, you know, most of the clerks are making the same recommendation. There's just not enough time. Nobody wants to be first, basically. We don't really know. Some of the details are not known. No one will certify the software to do the counting. You know, this is not um, uh, a good idea. We should just skip it. Maybe, maybe next time, right? Do it next time. And so we had a discussion at committee, and we had a split vote at committee a 3-2 to recommend that we go ahead with the public consultation on, on making the change anyway. And so that went through and it passed the council to at least get the consultation underway. And then it came back later in 2017. And I'm talking, we went right up to the last minute. So May 1st, 2017 is one year before a candidates can declare uh, for the 2018 election. And that was the deadline for deciding. If you're going to do rank ballots, you have to make a decision by May 1st. Um, so we had a special meeting, went all the way to a special council meeting. We had a discussion. Uh, on the way to that special council meeting, we had another one of these votes at committee about should we be proceeding, and it failed. It failed 3-3, a tie vote, and it failed. And, and the mayor, um, who had not signed the petition but had been sort of, I think, generally supportive of ranked ballots, um, he was the vote that tied it and made it fail at committee. And so we were going to the council meeting not really knowing where it was going to go. Uh, uh, it's one thing to support something by signing a petition when you're running for office. Uh, it's, been, it's now years later. 
there's a deadline, there's these concerns about implementation. So we really didn't know how it was going to turn out in the actual vote. In the end, uh, nine people voted in favor, uh, five people voted against, one person was not there. So it passed 9-5. Uh, we implemented the rank ballots. And uh, it worked. Yeah, and the mayor flipped by the council meeting. So he ended up supporting, he ended up supporting ranked ballots. Um, and his concern was mostly around implementation. That's why he was reluctant to do it. There was very little call for, you know, you should have a referendum before you implement ranked ballots. Uh, that was not really an argument that people made. We had a public meeting on it and people had different opinions as you might imagine. Um, but I think it's, it's important to look at what is ranked ballot really changing, right? It's changing the consequence of having a lot of candidates Right? Um, in, a, in a system of first past the post, having a lot of candidates is good for incumbents because incumbents have name recognition, a lot of built-in advantages. Having a lot of challengers means it's all divided up and you can win with a pretty small margin, um, which, which happens. And in our case, the people who didn't support uh, ranked ballots, switching to ranked ballots, a lot of them had very small margins of victory. So some of them were like four or five percentage points. Uh, that was it. Um, there was one person who had a larger margin of victory uh, like 66 percentage points as an incumbent for a long time. And uh, he didn't support it, I think, because he's just sort of fundamentally conservative about the electoral system. Um, but we managed to get it through. And, and I think it's interesting that it was actually the oldest five members of council who did not support changing it. So literally the five oldest people. Um, so uh, we, we managed to get it through. And I think part of the reason is we had a very unique circumstance in London which was in that 2014 election, we not only elected a bunch of people who supported ranked ballots, we elected 73% of the people on the council were brand new, which just does not happen very often in uh, Ontario municipal politics. And uh, we never had to run for re-election, so we were naive <laughs> about how hard it would be under a ranked ballot. And I don't know if we can get to that in the questions, I'm happy to talk about that, but it is a lot harder as an incumbent to get re-elected uh, under a ranked ballot system and it does change things for incumbents. And I think in terms of implementing ranked ballots, we need to be clear about that. I think that's, you're trying to convince the incumbents to make a change that's not gonna be necessarily good for them. Okay, please join me in thanking Jesse. Thanks for sharing that story. All right, and last but not least, uh, let's hear your story, Ariel. Uh, so I'm gonna talk um, about my experience of uh, running in a ranked ballot system and how I found out about it and, and why I decided to run because of a ranked ballot system. So Dave said that, um, he doesn't want, the, that he doesn't want my victory to be connected to ranked ballot, but um, I don't think that if there were no ranked ballot, I would have ran because um, I attended an information session um, at the City of London and they were explaining what ranked ballot was and um, it sounded much more positive and it sounded... Um, I just felt like it wasn't gonna be one of those campaigns where it was gonna be a smear campaign and it was gonna probably cost less money to, to, to do material where you're just talking about yourself and uh, talking about your platform, talking about who you are, what you wanna do and what you're bringing um, to the table and not about what the other candidate is. Um, and that was after I'd actually done a lot of research on um, some of the people that I knew uh, were gonna come back and run again. Uh, there was no incumbent in my race, but um, we were about eight people who ran, and I was the youngest, the, the only woman, and the only person of color. Uh, it was quite an interesting race. Um, I took time to understand ranked ballot, and I'm glad I did, because uh, so even though <laughs> I won the first choices, um, I won by 29.2% of the votes. It's not a lot. Um, it doesn't make you feel good either to know that there's that many people who didn't vote for you. Um, but we were a lot of people, so people had the opportunity to, to make the first choice seven, eight people. So um, that's also important to note. Uh, but in the end, um, I didn't reach the 50%. I was one of the three candidates who didn't reach the 50%, uh, but I got 40-something percent. And um, then you know that even the people who voted for the other candidates still voted for you. I think every single one of them, um, I got at least five votes from each one of them, minimum. <laughs> there was some candidates where I got more of their votes than others, but uh, because I understood how ranked ballot was, was going to be working, I actually spent a lot of time um, 
and energy, uh, focusing on my the, my opponents. You know, uh, understanding um, we some of them, most of them, we had very similar political leanings and we had similar platforms. Um, it was important for me to connect with their voters as well and not leave them out and make sure that um, if they don't make me their first choice, I can be their second choice. A lot of my opponents didn't really do that work. It showed because some of, you know, some of the campaign had a little bit of smear campaign. But the reason why I decided to run in this um, ranked ballot voting um, system was because I knew that it wasn't going to just be about me. It was going to be more positive. My opponents are going to need my voters as well. They're, they don't know who who's going to be in the lead or not. So they're going to be seeking. We're going to be focused on voters and not each other. So that as a young woman, as a woman of color, that's really important in a city like London. Um, so it was really, we had probably the best um, debates. People talked about how we had the best debates. We were the most prepared because we understood that we were trying to get everyone's votes. We're trying to get every single person who was in the room's vote. And you didn't know who was going to be in the lead or who wasn't going to be in the lead. I had an idea of some of the people who were my strongest opponents or some of the people that I couldn't appear to, to their voters. And I focused on the people that um, I knew. We had similar beliefs. People liked them as much as they liked me. And I focused also on their, on their on their voters, and that's how I ended up getting um, a little bit more percentage in the turnout. But um, also knowing that you're not going to spend a whole bunch of money um, on material that you don't need to just run a negative campaign and uh, smearing the other person, and it costs a lot of money. Um, it was very helpful to know that uh, the rank ballot system was there. Um, and people can choose. If there was another woman who would have run against me, um, Personally, I wouldn't run another, I've, I've said this before in uh, Kate Graham's class, I wouldn't run against another black woman because my goal in that, in that moment when I decided to run, I wanted to see different voices at council represented and I wasn't going to be running against another black woman. I was going to let her run. But if there would have been another non-black woman who would have ran, um, at least people would have had two choices and um, we would have ran you know, good campaigns. We probably would have helped each other. We probably would have shared volunteers. Um, just because people get to choose who they want out of the two, and it could be her, it could be me, but at least one of us is gonna is gonna get in, right? That's that's the way I process it in my mind. Um, but I ended up being the only woman. I knew that was somewhat of an advantage, um, and at times it wasn't always an advantage. But um, and also understanding how rank ballot system was gonna work, it was a huge advantage to me. And even on election day, our campaign was the only campaign that was actually pushing to get every single second and third, um, third vote. Um, we know that because we spoke to a lot of people who didn't know who they were gonna rank as their second and third, and they decided to rank me in the end, uh, last minute on election day. Um, there was also, um, Yeah, so we, you know, that, that was one of the reasons why I decided to, to, to put my name forward. It was less intimidating um, as a young woman, as a woman of color. Um, I, that's what I understood. That's what I took from Rank Ballot. I didn't know the history of Rank Ballot and how it came to be. I just knew that a lot of people were not excited about it, but I was. And when people also asked me, that's what I want to say. When people asked me, who should I rank as my second and third um, choice, people who, who, were, I, who identified me as their first choice, and I was able to share, I like this person. I think you should add them as a second or third decide. But these are the two people that I would recommend. Um, and it happened very often. Um, that people would call me last minute or even before and ask me, we're thinking of ranking because we want it to stay. We want the system to stay. We don't want to exhaust our, our, our ballot. So we want, you, we want your opinion on who should we rank second and, and third. And I was able to share with them. Um, so, and our, our campaign um, for my race, like the War 13 race, it was very positive. Um, 
there was some negative stuff that happened. And for the people who didn't understand that, hey, if we have the same political leaning, maybe you shouldn't try to smear me. Maybe you shouldn't try to portray me as the villain because that's not working for you. It's going to get me more votes than it's going to get you. Or people who were originally going to support you are now going to be more inclined to support me. Um, I'm sure they learned. Um, but we had a great campaign. We had a very competitive very strong competitive campaign uh, race where every single candidate was fighting to win the election. And um, uh, it was it was nice to see that it was very um, positive. We stayed on our platforms. We stayed on, you know, the voters were the main focus and not each other. Um, so that's that to me is important as a woman. Um, not to, to be a subject of a campaign. I wouldn't want to wake up in the morning and find my name in the newspaper where my opponent has decided to dig up something about me because he has to make me look bad so he can win. So uh, that's another aspect of the ranked ballot that I really, really liked um, that encouraged me and that I, I, you know, I spoke about to encourage other younger people and younger women and women of color to, to put their name forward. Um, and the finance um, side of it as well, as most of us who are young, who are, you know, women, women of color, we come from, you know, some of, I was a student right before I decided to run, right? Like, it's not like I have a whole bunch of money sitting somewhere and I didn't have that connection. I ran against people who were very well connected and very well known and uh, financially more stable than I was, um, who, you know, it's easier for them to spend that kind of money on a campaign, but I didn't have to do a whole lot because I just worked on my platform. I worked on my platform. I didn't print any extra material to, to attack any other candidate. It was more focused on me, and that was the message across my entire campaign and my volunteers was, were focusing on our campaign, our platform, what we want to do, and that's it. And that's what we did, and we, we won. So actually, when uh, the, we didn't get our results the night of, of the election, uh, Dave, um, I had only heard of him. I didn't really know him that well. He showed up at my campaign party <laughs> and with a computer and a camera, I think, yeah. and a backpack. And he came to me. He was like, well, you know, I decided to pick you and yeah, I'm going to watch your campaign. I was like, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, who are you? And he was like, my name is Dave. And he really seemed very confident of who he was. I didn't asked too many questions. I was like, well, thank you. You know, welcome. Join the party. My family's here. Everybody's here. You know, let's enjoy it. And he, he just sat in the corner and was taking notes and looked like he was studying me. And I eventually was like, What's, what, what are you doing? Like, campaign's over. I don't want to campaign anymore. And why are you taking notes? And, you know, but he explained to me why he was there. And uh, we stuck together. I was really nervous when I found out that he was, he picked my campaign out of so many other campaigns that he could have picked. So I was like, okay, if I lose, you've wasted your time. <laughs> but um, I think he might have heard or had heard that I, I actually decided to run because of ranked ballot. Um, I am very confident that I would not have put my name forward to run against seven men if it was not a ranked ballot system. It would have, I would have quit. I would have walked, up, walked out of the campaign because it's very intimidating, but the rank ballot system gave me that confidence to know that. I'm not competing with other people, I'm bringing forth my platform. So um, on the next day, when, when actually the night, the night of, we found out that we were, uh, the first choice came out and I was leading and I remember I just turned around straight to him, I was like, who the hell came up with this rank ballot idea? <laughs> I was like, who did this? And he, he was like, remember why you decided to do it? I was like, yeah, I know. I, I, I will still support it, but I'm very disappointed that we have to wait till tomorrow and that I could lose. Because I had hoped that I'd be like a second, I'd come out in second place. And as a second place, then I would need all of the other people's support, you know, their votes to kind of push me over and, and win. But we were in the leading position. And I was just worried that like, does that mean every person who's in the leading, from the way I understood or from the way I watched, like a lot of the videos on Ranked Ballot, I was like, oh my God, I think I'm gonna come off. I think I'm gonna be the person to drop off. So the next day was a very long day and um, all of us were actually together on the next day. Um, we're all in the, same, in the same kitchen, in the same room. And he kept with the video thing, he just stayed around, you know, following me around the videos. Like, I, I really can't do this because if I lose, then, you know, your, your video is not going to mean anything. And he's like, nope, I still, whether you win or not, I still want to follow 
through because you actually decided to run because of ranked ballot. And um, it was nice to have um, everyone's support. So, and Kate used to be my teacher, so she was there and Jesse's now my colleague. <laughs> and it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was a very emotional moment. Um, it was emotional for a lot of people, for myself. Um, there's a video online that went viral that I, I don't watch because every single time I watch it, I cry. Um, I stay away from it. Um, but yeah, so that's my story. And um, we're very excited. A lot of great things happening in London. And uh, the progressives are staying on the front. Awesome. Please give it up for Ariel. Okay, so you've heard from our fantastic panel. We're making really good time here. We've got about 35 minutes left together. We're going to save that last 10 minutes, as I mentioned, to turn back to the panel and ask a very specific question, which is about what can you do now? You know, that call to action, what can you do to, uh, you know, see ranked ballots come in your community? But until then, uh, we're open for questions. So please put up your hand. Maybe tell us who you are, and if there's someone specific on the panel you'd like to speak, uh, let us know. So why don't we start right here? Okay, so my name's Shermila, I'm from Mississauga. Um, I wanna know how we go about mobilizing. Like what is the effort needed? Because in Mississauga, like 57% of the population is racialized. We now have a non, one person who's racialized who happened to be a former MPP. Like that's the level of caliber you have to be almost to be a racialized person to win. And that's because of the incumbency. And full disclosure, I ran too um, recently, which uh, was like a big deal in the ward that I live in. Um, so just putting your name on the ballot. But I am wondering about how to mobilize around this because people's response to um, the division of lower votes because you've got more candidates is to try to create more barriers to say, okay, rather than 25 signatures, let's make it 100 signatures where that's not really the issue when you already have low voter turnout and no media. Um, so I just kind of wanted to hear a bit more about that, like what will it take? Because the councillors themselves are going to be a problem when you've got 30 years serving councillors. Like what's the advantage to them until they retire? But how, you know, what, what else was needed to really bring this forward? Sorry, that was long. Is there anyone specific? No. Or anyone. Okay. Who wants to take that? I can start. Um, every city is totally e unique. So I, I can share some reflections of what's worked in other cities. First of all, is your mayor still Crombie? Yeah. So she's on the record supporting it. She has said to me personally, and I think she said it uh, at a, did anyone remember? Anyways, she, she, she's on the record. She, she supports it. Um, I don't know enough about the rest of your council. It's funny, in terms of gender, Mississauga is actually amazing, um, uh, much better than other cities. In fact, of the 50 largest cities in Canada, only four have a female mayor, and Mississauga has for I think a thousand years or something. Um, only, two, only two mayors, but they were all women. That's one person. Yeah. Um, it was a really slow process in, in Toronto, which, which doesn't even have it yet, because we didn't have this, we had a, kind of champions on council, but nothing like, like you guys. Um, but we brought in journalists. I really spent a lot of time having coffees and lunches with journalists one by one and getting them on board. From the right, from the left, Sue Ann Levy. What's that, um, the, the guy, um, the 1010 radio, like total right wing libertarian. Yeah, Jerry Agar, like I just went for anyone and every, all of them came on board. And then community leaders too. And then one of the first things we did is just produce this list of quotes from the right and the left, so the Jonathan Goldsby's and the Sue Ann Levy's and um, heads of different associations and unions uh, just to show a multi-partisan um, support which gives you some credibility. You do need some kind of champion on council. I mean, someone has to move a motion and then just baby steps. So don't try and find a motion to switch to ranked ballots. Do a motion to just ask staff for a report on the feasibility or the options. Um, have as many events as you can. Recruit volunteers and feed them. Um, and just be very patient. That's good advice. Ariel, Jesse, you want to speak to this? Just very briefly, I, I think emphasizing that what's changing about ranked ballots is you're collecting more information from voters about their preferences. And when it comes down to it, very few people are actually against that. Right? So if you say, I want to collect more information from people about what they want, 
Like who said, no, you know, like we can't do that. Um, so, you know, the details, I think when it's positioned as like a big radical change, you find almost instantaneous opposition from people who are just against big radical change of any kind. And the truth is, it's not that big of a change. Uh, it's a small change. And what we're doing is we're changing how much information we're getting from voters. So I think if you, if you focus on that, it kind of mm, mitigates some of the opposition that would be naturally there. And it starts to make the arguments a bit easier to win. Because Dave was talking about how it kind of seems ridiculous. Like, why would you not want to get a bit more information about what people's preferences are? Yeah. And then I think it will help as, as you know, London has gone forward, uh, assuming the province leaves things the way they are, which I think is a big assumption that may not be true. Um, if they do, and other municipalities, you know, have referenda and then decide to switch, and it starts to build that, and people can look and say, look, the, you know, in, in London, I, I want to emphasize, I think it changed uh, who was running in some cases, but in, in the specific example in London, everyone who was leading on the first round was the person who won at the end. And so for people who are afraid of it, you know, they look at that and they say, oh, it's not that, that's not that different. Um, now, I think they're kind of missing the point. So for example, in London in 2014, um, we had about 21% of the candidates uh, were racialized people. Zero of them were racialized women. Right? Uh, in 2018, uh, six candidates were racialized women. Right? So it went from zero to six in terms of who is running. Right? And so, and then one person was elected, which is the first person ever. Right? So, so I think, you know, what's changing is, is who's deciding to run and who sticks it out all the way through the campaign, uh, which is, uh, can be a very difficult process. And, you know, I think trying to, um, address the concerns that people have that it's too radical and talk about it as though it's not that radical, I mean, it's a successful advocacy strategy. Ariel, did you want to add anything? There's no obligation? Oh, I don't have, I don't really, it's up to you. I don't really have a lot to add on that other than um, if you say that your community is more racialized than your, your representative, then there's room to, to reach out to, the, to your communities and get volunteers and mobilize them and make them understand why it's important and Okay, uh, who else had a question? I feel like I'm picking, I'm gonna be biased and people geographically close so I don't have to walk far. Uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you, okay, so I have a comment that I would like your reaction to or, or um, your thoughts on. So I am a huge advocate of ranked ballots. Um, this municipal election is the only election that I have not voted in London for. Um, so unfortunately I like lost out on voting in the first one. Um, but a lot of the concerns that I've heard from family, friends that lived in London was, you know, this is complicated, this is a, this is a big change, it's bureaucratically, you know, difficult, um, which I, you know, from not even living there was trying to dispel and try to encourage people to, to still participate in the ranked ballot system. Um, and then, you know, eagerly watching on election night and then into the next day and then into the next afternoon, um, as someone who wasn't present in the city, I found it very difficult because it was a little bit anticlimactic the shot that we were getting on news that we could access in Toronto was like a very tired looking city staff member who just looked like she was so upset that this was happening and like so tired and wanted to go to bed and you know was frustrated by the whole process. And so I think as someone who wanted that to be, you know, an example of something that could really like motivate people, was gonna be exciting, was gonna be, you know, covered well, um, it was anticlimactic and didn't show, you know, some of the good stories about what what happened in the results of the election because it you know, went into the next day and, and the website looked like it was made in the 80s and it was just like it was um, kind of anticlimactic. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on that and how um, that can be changed in the future to make sure that people can be watching from other cities across the province and, and really see it as being um, something that they want their city to do. Nope. Okay, who wants to take that? I'm, I'm curious to hear the, the family and friends who were worried about the complication, was that before they voted? Or did they actually vote and say it was complicated? They were worried going into it. But then afterwards, did they, yeah, and they, they ranked their vote? So I, I, I went to, one of the things I did there, both for advanced voting and on voting day, was uh, interviewing people as they came out. In fact, there's a great video we've got up. Uh, the website is londonleads.ca, and I got a collage of voters, all women, which was just random. They're the ones who, who spoke to me. and. Um, Ask them how, how they felt with their experience of voting. So what I heard was that people 
um, might have been concerned again in advance, but but felt comfortable. The, the 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 final results came in in under 24 hours, which is actually pretty good for for the first city to try it. They also could have done it much quicker. The clerk made decisions um, that I can't necessarily disagree with, but she really played it safe. Um, they had all the data the night before. They could have instantly tabulated every round in a millisecond. And they chose not to because they wanted to do all these tests and assurances for each round. Um, it, it, it could be done faster. Okay, other comments on that, Ariel? Oh, and by the way, the clerk, I think, is on board now. Yeah. Um, and sh this, this, no, you, maybe not. Um, this, this thing, the same staff who wrote the original report saying, I don't think we should do this, um, she might have been tired in that shot you saw, but I saw her do lots of interviews, and she was being asked questions, and I saw her being really positive and defending the entire concept, and I think she's actually flipped. I, th I think she's proud that London led. I can understand where um, the friends and the families are coming from, because I think that um, there was a video that we had, you know, the City of London had explaining what rank ballot was, and then they went to, you know, farther to explain how the other votes were going to go to the other people, like how the, the last, the person who had the least votes was going to fall off the ballot and all that kind of stuff. So it, it's a lot when you're just explaining that to someone with oranges and bananas and, and apples. Like, it, it took me three times to watch it at, um, at least to understand it. But uh, when you're, when you just tell them, like, listen, just pick three people you like and vote for them. And in the end, one of them might win, right? So you're, 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 increase, you're increasing your chances of, of um, having one of your, your for, you know, the people that you, you prefer win. Also, sometimes people are caught in between two people. Like, I really like her, I really like her too, but I don't wanna split the vote. Who should I vote for? Rank ballot just removes that. And I think maybe, also, people are not really, not everyone's politically, involved like when I was explaining it to my family it was like just just pick two people or three people and and click their names well I don't know all three people and just just pick two at least don't don't just pick one pick two people or three people and just click on them it's like how is this going to work in the end I'll explain it to you but right now you need to go and vote just and when we spoke to people who were coming out of the voting stations we're like oh that was easy all I did was just put your name you know and then pick other, two other people. Or some people would say things like, I put your name three times. That's not good. Don't put the name three times. But um, at least they're trying to participate in, in ranking people. And um, in terms of why the votes came in so late, um, I would also say the same thing that Dave said. I think they're just trying to be more safe and make sure that um, it was the first time we try it. We didn't want any problems. Um, and I trust that they made the right decision and hopefully the next election we'll see it a little bit more faster and party on the day of. Uh, j just very briefly, I would say, I, before the election, I, I wanted the results to come really fast, but having seen how they rolled out over the time period, I think for the first one that was actually better. So I would describe it as sort of like a feature rather than a bug um, because everyone could see each round they rolled them out ward by ward and round by round, right? So every round came out slowly. Yeah. And people could see how things were changing. And I think in terms of people learning how the counting works, yeah. um, <clears throat> that was probably the most helpful thing was to trickle out the results, which is something people are very interested in slowly over the course of a whole day. Uh, so I think it was maddening for people who just wanted to know the very specific results. For example, Ariel is word 13, so she was near the end <laughs> of this whole long line of, of results coming out. Um, but uh, I think it actually was, was okay in the end. And in terms of nobody changed positions in terms of the rankings, I mean, that's a result of who ran, the kind of campaigns they ran. That, that has nothing to do with the system or how it was rolled out. It's just uh, we had that kind of election. Um, and that'll probably change in the future without us doing anything. Okay, next question up here. Sir, what is your name and what's your question? My name is Frederick Stefano, and it's really uh, an open question. First is, Dave, what's the title of your book? The second point about complexity, if you look at the first past the post system of American uh, elections, like the midterm elections, I mean, they're really complicated. But the question I have really is, Australia has had, first, has had ranked voting in their legislature, 
But in our media, when people talk about voting reform, the default is proportional representation. Recently, British Columbia had a referendum. It was on proportional representation. Why is it always the default position? Okay. For Dave? For Dave. For Dave, okay. That was a lot of questions, and the last one is really complicated. The book's called Teardown, that's easy. The website is teardown.build. I don't know what build is for, maybe construction workers, but I took it. Because the tagline is Teardown, Rebuilding Democracy from the Ground Up. So it's an angry book, but also really optimistic and constructive and very playful with cartoons. Um, what was the other question? Oh, the global stuff is really funny um, in terms of you mentioning Australia, because when you were introducing me, you said how you know maybe I'm a, I'm a global leader for, for a reform on ranked ballots. There's no such Definitely. thing. There's no such thing, because we're one of the only countries that doesn't already use a fair voting system. First past the post is a terribly obscure voting system. And as many of you may know, there's no post to pass. Uh, the name doesn't make any sense. The system we're talking about is first past the post. The post is 50%, and whoever passes it wins. In first past the post, there is no post, which is, it's, a, it's, its name is, is, it's criminal that it's named so incorrectly. Um, I'm actually a big fan of proportional representation in the right context, um, when the conditions are right for that level of, of government and jurisdiction. Um, for municipal governments in Ontario, I think this is the right reform, and that's why I founded the Rabbit Campaign, and I've been doing all, 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 all this work. Um, and all the benefits that we've heard described would, would happen if you did it provincially or federally. So anyone could run, you vote with your heart, not your calculator, you, there'd be no vote splitting, it would increase civility. Um, but the real boost in, in both um, gender and racial diversity don't kick in until you have a proportional system. And you could even have outcomes under a ranked ballot that are more distorted on a, in a partisan election than under first past the post. If I had a pick in a referendum between first past the post and ranked ballots federally or provincially, I would vote yes. I think it's better than what we have. But it would be such a lousy compromise compared to what we should have. And in my book, I compare the different models. I give first past the post an, an F. I give the system we're talking about a C plus, And I give any proportional model an A. So, I mean, we, it's, and there's so many different types of proportionality. A ranked ballot gets you from plurality to majority, which is great. But if, to me, proportional, and democracy and election are all synonyms. If an outcome isn't proportional to what people asked for in the election, what was the point of having it? Okay. Just, just a quick comment. I, I always assumed that proportionality would fracture our party system. And if you look at some of the countries that have pure systems, I mean, it's just crazy. They could have 30 or 40 parties, which means coalitions by parties in the legislature. Yeah. And if we looked at Germany, they had a discussion for six months between four parties to form a coalition, and in the end, they couldn't do it. So, I mean, there's really some issues with governability in terms of yeah. proportionality. So I address that in the book. I won't go into detail now, but the data proves otherwise. Um, so all of, all of Europe, except for France and the UK, use PR. And if you look at the frequency of elections and the stability of their coalitions, they're more stable than our Westminster model. So the stability argument is backwards. In terms of extremism, it's backwards because we saw who was elected south of the border under first past the post. Um, and Italy and Israel, which are often raised as examples of why PR are bad, they're just crazy countries for other reasons. You can have, I'm sorry, you can, have, you can use any voting system in Italy and Israel and you're still in Italy or Israel. <laughs> Okay, so that's a good teaser. I think we should all buy Dave's book or at least read Dave's book when it comes out uh, in May. Other questions? Yes. Okay. All right, sir, tell us your name and your question. John, and congratulations on the book. And Thank to you. my brother for helping you with it. <laughs> So this is a bit of a riff on the simplicity question that's come up a bunch of times. I'm just wondering like what's being done to kind of build the evidence base now about to counter the simplicity argument going forward. Like were there 
more uh, spoiled ballots than in the past in the London election? Or, you know, is any survey data being conducted to bring that forward? Um, I just, I think it's a great opportunity to kind of build the story um, as you continue the, com the campaign. I'm glad you said that because I've been meaning to reach out to either of you. We need that data. So the word spoiled is used differently in different jurisdictions. So if you look at the Minneapolis data, for example, it shows a high number of spoiled ballots. But what, the way we use spoiled in Canada is different than the way they use spoiled. So spoiled can mean that, um, that it was filled out wrong and then didn't count. Spoiled can also mean that when you put it in the machine, if the machine is programmed this way, it rejected it and said, can you fix it? You didn't do it right. But then you fixed it and it was still counted. So Minneapolis included that. London, for some reason, I believe, didn't even use that option. I, th I don't think the machine spat them back out if you filled it out improperly, which is weird. Oh, good, I, ho I hope I'm wrong. But the clerk should release not only how many were spoiled, how many were filled incorrectly, but how many people ranked. How many people ranked three, how many people ranked two. I haven't seen that data yet, maybe it's been released. It's online, H how does it look? So good news, Dave. Uh, you can go to the Open Data Catalog and the City of London website and get all the results for mayor, all the award races, including the ones where someone was elected with over 50% of the vote on the first round. So you can see all the data for all the rankings. So for the mayoral election, 70% uh, of people ranked. So 30% of people didn't rank. And, and in the actual election, um, three out of the four sort of leading candidates for mayor were saying basically, don't rank. So that was the messaging that they were sending in the campaign was vote for me and don't vote for anybody else, which is a terrible strategy in a ranked ballot uh, election. I didn't stop the person who was elected mayor from being elected and also didn't stop people from ranking. So we had a lot of candidates saying, don't do this. And uh, people did anyway. So 70% of people in my particular election in Ward 4, 60% uh, of people ranked. And in that election, um, the person who finished second, who was previously the incumbent uh, a couple of elections ago, uh, he had on all his literature, vote for me only, no one else, signs, me only, no one else. He pushed that message as hard as he possibly could. And only 50% of his voters voted for him only. You know, so half his voters voted for someone else anyway, despite all that messaging. So I think it did have a bit of a dampening effect in terms of how many people ranked. In a lot of other places, you have 85% or more of people who are ranking, um, but it's available now in London. And the, the rejected ballots include people who uh, just, just did something different than what was expected. So they're not actually rejected. In fact, no. So if you, left, if you left one part of the ballot blank, yeah. so you just didn't vote, let's say for, um, you voted for mayor and you didn't vote for uh, councillor, that shows up as rejected for only that election. Right, so you have to be careful how you're interpreting so what it. what is the actual number? If, if you eliminate those, which should never be called rejected, that was, that's it. You guys should gotta fix that. That was, because she was on the news on election night being like, with this really high number of rejected ballots, and none of them were actually spoiled. So what is the actual number of people who messed up their ballot? I don't, I, I don't know precisely, but it's low. It's not Let, Let's find out. High. It'd be a good number to have. Yeah. And, Point and zero, was, zero 002, that's what I wanna be able to say. I don't think it was that low, but um, so uh, this is also being studied by academics, right? And I think we're going to get a lot of good uh, research out of the out of the election. The Canadian Municipal Election Study uh, included London. Uh, they're looking specifically at the ranked ballots. They surveyed candidates about ranked ballots specifically. So there, there's academic research underway, which you don't have to rely on us to tell you what happened. You can get it from the academics directly, which I think will be better than relying on us. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. Uh, Kim, you had your hand up. Oh, thanks, uh, Kim Devine. Um, I just want to follow up on what you were talking about uh, with regard to the rejected ballots. So if voters are asked for three choices and they just picked one or two, is that rejected? No. no. Oh, it's not. Okay, okay. Um, my question is, um, how does the ranking system compare with an at-large system other than just doing away with um, wards? I'll take that. Feel free to add. So it can, it can be used in a multi-member district. And in fact, under the right circumstances, that's the best way to use it. When you use ranked ballots in a multi-member district, either at large, let's say a city has 10 councillors. So at large would mean that the district has 10 councillors. You could also have two districts with five each, or three, three, and six, whatever. Um, sorry, three, three, and four. Um, that actually gets you towards proportionality because the threshold changes. So the threshold is only 50% when you're electing one person. 
If you're electing two people, the threshold goes down to 33%. Three people, 25%. And that's when you have a situation where a demographic that um, perhaps uh, represents 20% of the population can start winning a seat. The, m the more seats per district, the more proportional it is and the more diverse the outcome. But it can make races more expensive too. For example, I don't think that would work in Toronto. Toronto, sh no city council should ever be this big in the first place. Um, so I, I don't recommend multi-member. It's called STV, single transferable vote, which sounds like an STD. <laughs> it's not. Um, but it can be just as much fun to get. <laughs> okay, so there's been a little bit of lobbying going on here. This gentleman has uh, one comment he'd like to make, and he'll have the final word. Um, I was actually going to observe that you uh, can have proportional systems with ranked ballots, which is single transferable vote. Stay away from the acronyms. Is this working or no? Yep. Okay. Um, uh, so the question was about at large, uh, and that's actually the way you get the most proportionality. You also get the most representation. More, the, the, in an at large, single transferable vote election, more people, the most people, get a, a rep of their choice Proportionality is high. Their mandate of each uh, rep is, is the highest. Um, it's it's it, it, the only problem with it. There's a, a, a pragmatics of having so many people on the on the ballot. Um, to the observation about um, uh, how long it takes, um, uh, and uh, and everybody's on tender hooks. In Ireland, they have STV for their uh, elections, and they hold the election. I think it's on the Friday but they actually turned the whole counting process into a, into a holiday on the weekend. And so I think a lot of, of, uh, of celebration is made, probably uh, uh, greased by Guinness. Okay, thank you, sir. I feel like you and Dave should hang out on weekends. You'd have a lot to talk about. We do. About. Oh, you do? Okay, well, that's good. That takes care of that. Uh, so in the few moments that we have left here before uh, we all go and enjoy the reception, and I, I think the bar opens up at five, so we're all gonna, uh, we can continue the discussion there. But I know that there is one question that is burning on your minds, on every mind. You're convinced ranked balloting is uh, the future for your municipality, so if you wanna see that happen, what should your next step be? So maybe we can start with Ariel and just ask for a, a quick response from each panelist. If people are inspired and wanna see this in their own community, what should they do? What's your advice? I think my advice would be um, to be more organized and, and connect with uh, different leaders of the community and, and begin to have the conversation, begin to contact your city councillors uh, that you know would support it. Don't contact the ones that wouldn't support it because you don't want to give them an idea that it's coming to, to the table before. Because <laughs> they, you know, anyways, you want to blindside them in a way. Uh, but connect with the people that you know would support it. Have the conversations and, and have some sessions where you can do some education on why it's important to have um, a ranked ballot. Invite some people like Dave to come and speak to your community and, um, you know, keep pushing and, and rally people to support it. And, um, and then, again, once you find a counselor who's willing to, to bring the motion and keep moving forward, but organize first, uh, have the grassroots with you, have the volunteers with you, have a system that you already can fall back on and then move it forward. So yeah, that's my. Wonderful, thank you. Jesse. I would suggest reaching out to um, partisans uh, who are involved in other kinds of politics and, and start getting them mobilized about ranked ballots. I, I think because of the 2015 electoral reform um, issue federally and what happened after that. Uh, people uh, within the progressive movement uh, were a little soured. We're a little soured on, uh, <laughs> thank you, that's a lot of mics. Um, uh, a little soured on ranked ballots because they saw it as something that the Liberal Party was pushing federally, right? So they're like, oh, it's just something that the Liberal Party people want. And I think it needs to be um, a broad coalition of people who are advocating for the change at the municipal level. I actually don't think ranked ballots are a great solution in party systems. Uh, I do think it makes a lot of sense at the municipal level. And I think that, is, that has gone away as a concern. It's just not being discussed as much uh, now. Uh, people are still mad about what happened uh, federally, but, but they're not as mad at ranked ballots specifically. So I would go after the progressive coalition of people 
um, try and get organized there on a nonpartisan basis or multipartisan basis to bring forward something in the community. Start getting people to sign off on it and say this is a good idea for these reasons. There's lots of different reasons why ranked ballots make things a little bit better. Um, and I think bringing all those arguments to bear is a good strategy. Um, you don't need to convince everyone with the same argument. Uh, so use different arguments with different people. Um, once you've got a, a, a kind of coalition of people, I would focus on the new councillors. If you have any new councillors, go talk to them before they have to go through re-election because after that, uh, it will be harder <laughs> to convince them. Um, and you know, I think pointing to the success in London in, in, in the sense that it didn't really cost a whole lot more money. Most of the extra costs of implementing it were because we added a lot of polling stations. So we increased the number of polling stations by 55%. That's why it was more expensive, right? So we gave people more places to vote. That's good on its own, for its own sake. Um, and, uh, and I would just point to those things. I think there's some good evidence coming out of the US and there are allies in the United States who will come. We had people from Minneapolis come to London and talk about why it was a good idea, how it worked there. Uh, and I think that was helpful in getting it over the bar. And then when the uh, forces of the status quo uh, rear their head and try and stop it, which they will, um, we had Justin DiCiano, for example, come down to London and meet with councillors like a couple days before the final vote. And he was leaning hard on people. They had a booth at the AMO meeting saying that, you know, keep voting. Simple. Acronym alert. Uh, oh, sorry, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. Thank you, Dave. Um, so this is a big meeting for all the municipalities in, in Ontario, and they had a booth there saying, you know, don't let this happen in your municipality. Um, so, you know, they'll push back and, and I, th I get ready. And then when you're ready, bring it forward and try and get incremental wins on the way to getting it done. So you don't have to get it all done at once. Uh, but you do have to get certain things through to make it happen. And, and the clock is ticking. You will run out of time between now and, and 2022 if you're not going soon. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't, don't wait. The election seems far away, but these things take, take years. Um, if any city is going to use ranked ballots in 2022, it's because someone moved a motion this year. And, and, and soon. Hamilton's already moved a motion, so th things are happening. So I wrote this website up here. 123ontario.ca. It's got a list of all the campaigns that are active right now. Um, it would be great to add Mississauga to it. And um, Toronto's really ripe. Um, Michael Urban's here from the Rabbit Campaign. And they've got a table out there with a petition. And what, what they've been doing and what we've been doing with Rabbit for 10 years now or, or longer, I don't even want to know, is like getting as many names of supporters into our database. And then, and then using them to target councillors geographically. And this is something you have to do in Mississippi. You have wards, right? Yeah, single member wards. Um, it works, it's very effective to get citizens not just to sign a big, the, 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 the best use of a petition is just to get them into your database. But the politicians often ignore it. It's then what you do with those names. And what you wanna do is not to just get someone to email all of council and say, I live in Mississauga, this is what I care about, but I live in your ward. This is my address. Um, um, and I want you to move on this. Take a really multi-partisan approach. Go after conservatives. It's actually all based on free market ideology. Vote splitting is a market distortion. And if competition increases um, innovation and, and that disruption in a sector is good and all that, all that free market conservative talk, then you wanna have a voting system that encourages new voices and allows markets to be disrupted um, and ensures that market share equals revenue share at the end of the exchange. So I've had a lot of luck, um, not luck, a lot of success um, getting conservatives on board. And that changes the dynamic a bit because it's really harmful to the movement that we're often seen as a left-wing thing. There's nothing left-wing at all about fair elections. Um, so again, website, if you're in a city that has a campaign, please join them. Talk to, put your hand up again. Talk to Michael right after this if you live in Toronto. If you're in a city that doesn't have a campaign, please come and talk to me. It's really fun to run a local campaign. And Mississaugas will be launched probably within the next month, I think. We're on a, we're on a good tempo now, we're good? Yeah, I think by March we're gonna have, um, we're gonna have one, two, three Mississauga. And if anyone else Pressure. wants to start one, let me know. And again, like, We've been using, it's really effective as an advocate to use existing precedents. When I'm advocating for physically separated bike lanes, I can say, look, they've got them in New York, they've got them in Ottawa and Montreal. And for the last 10 years, I've had to say, look at Minneapolis or look at, you know, San Francisco. And those seem far and distant. And now I can say, look at London. 
the sky didn't fall, um, the results came out within a day, there's more diversity on council, there weren't many spoiled ballots. So we have a precedent now, first in our lifetime anywhere in Canada. Let's build on that. There's 444 municipalities, municipalities in Ontario. Only one has done it so far. So in one sense, that's depressing. On the other sense, what a huge opportunity. Because if you add on the two referendum we've won, that's still 441 councils who can decide to move on this next week. So let's make that happen. Thanks. Oh, sorry, I gotta say one more rule, 20 seconds. And again, this is just the first step. Once we get this, we're just getting the ball rolling. We need things like proportional representation, permanent residents being allowed to vote, elected community boards and borough councils and election finance rules that are more accessible. We have so much work to do. This is a baby step. Let's get it done fast. Thank you. Okay. All right, so we've clearly got some work to do. Uh, hopefully we can carry on the conversation as we